Hey, hey, hey. Hi, welcome back to another Trek Chat, a podcast brought to you by Trek on the Tube. I am your uh, usual host, Sean, and today joining me are two very special guests. One is returning. He's a uh, colleague and, 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 and a content creator just like me, uh, co-host of the Text Trek podcast, Fathery. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good, and I, I don't think that's fair to say two special guests. I think uh, I am I'm the least special of the two that are here today, but uh, I appreciate it anyways. Every every guest is special here. Yeah, every guest exactly. is special. I'm honored to have everyone, um, and I'm very honored to uh, to announce that we have Robert Hewitt Wolf here. How hey you guys. doing? I am good. Um, I don't know how like so how do people p- present you? Do they call you like executive producer for this 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 and that, or do they just call you like writer for movies, TV shows? Uh, I am both of those things, so it all works. It all works. Um, novelist, too. Hey. Uh, um, yeah, usually uh, uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf, uh, veteran Star Trek writer from Deep Space Nine, uh, executive producer of Elementary, and uh, writer on show, creator of uh, or developer of Andromeda, Dresden Files, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that, that's, that's pretty much it. Tricky. <laughs> Tricky as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming on. Today we're talking about Deep Space Nine. Uh, Deep I Space... like that topic. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I thought you might like a bit, a bit of Deep Space Nine. Um, and I know that Fathery loves that show as well. Yeah, that is probably, <laughs> probably my favorite TV show of all time. I always say Star Trek is my favorite thing, and DS9 is my favorite Star Trek show. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, then I won't hang up. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. If he said uh, if he said the next generation, you would have hung up. That's that's the. Well, you know, I wrote one of those too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still I'm still working on some. S- side note, I'm working on a on um. This should have come as a surprise, actually, but I I, I have written a parody rap uh, track for that episode specifically for a fistful of datas. <laughs> it's just that I I have baby on the tube. I have like a, a two year old baby at home every day at the moment, so I can't really record any clean audio. But I, I, I want to put that out at some point. Uh, it sounds awesome. Are you going to um, sample, are, Sean, are, are you going to sample uh, data saying, Varmoose, you little varmint? <laughs> no, I haven't. Got, I actually, no, I actually, I, I, I sampled um, a wolf saying, I am not a merry man, but that's from another episode. That is, it's not even the right episode. It's not the right episode, but it anyway, it works. It works. In my mind, it works. <laughs> um, yeah, no, today we're talking about Deep Space Nine. Uh, more specifically, it's, it's kind of serialized format and how it became serialized uh, later on in its run in a time where not everything was serialized on TV. And I was just wondering if things would have turned out different uh, or if, if we could imagine how things could have been different if it was serialized from the get-go. And so it's good we have an actual Deep Space Nine writer here with us and uh, and fans, so we can always do theories and what have you. So I was just, was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts about that. Uh, I mean, I can speak to... I mean, for the, for the time, you know, in a weird way, it was serialized from the beginning in that it had a much stronger through line episode to episode than uh, a show like um, Next Generation did, for example, or the original series in, in that we had a goal that was a series-long goal from the very beginning, and it wasn't just sort of an open-ended continuing mission. It was get Bajor into the Federation, help mm. build this world. And so there were numerous episodes in the beginning that were about that, uh, including progress, um, duet, um, uh, you, you know, uh, storyteller, <laughs> and then in the hands of the prophets. So there was some serialization right from the beginning. I think Michael always intended that. I think that the amount of serialization that um, the uh, n- the studio was comfortable with uh, increased over time. And you know, once the Dominion stuff started, we really kicked it into gear. Um, but it was never intended to be a, a, a show without a serialized element. It was always intended to feel more like Hill Street Blues than Dragnet, for example. Mm. So, that's, inter- that's interesting. So, so you- it wouldn't be different because it was always there. <laughs> okay. 
that's interesting. So you guys were, were uh, I'm sorry, you guys were specifically going for the uh, the integration of Bajor, and that was the biggest um, story element in the beginning. In the beginning, yes, the 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 Bajor and the Cardassians were really, and the prophets, all of that what was was originally intended to be the main serialized element mm. and the ex, the exploration of the of the gamma quadrant and discovering what was out there was also supposed to be a big part of it and the um oh hold on one second speaking of small children at home my dog is using <laughs> for a second no problem that's interesting i didn't know that at all I, th I thought that um, orig originally it wasn't supposed to be serialized and then it became serialized later on. And I didn't know that they, they had uh, such, such kind of grand views for the integration of Bajor in the Federation. Sorry, I have a puppy who's still learning to use his dog door. And so he just sort of stands at it and whines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he'll get there. Um, so, yeah, so if you hear any dog sounds in the background, he's now come in. Um, so, yeah, the, those were supposed to be the major elements, and really the initial impetus towards the Dominion was to put a more definitive face uh, on the Gamma Quadrant, um, in keeping with that serialized element as well, because we also had those sort of what's out there sort of stories right from the beginning, too. Um, and they were supposed to be more standalone, but once we introduced the Dominion and figured out what we, the story wanted to tell, oh, there he goes, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> that... That really informed the rest of the series, obviously. You said that the initial idea from the beginning was to make the show more serialized about one ongoing story with the uh, Bajor and Cardassian uh, setting that I, I guess that uh, was created for the show. Wh whose idea was it to uh, make the show be more focused instead of doing a, a bunch of more standalone-ish type stories? I mean, as far as I know, I, and I wasn't there right from the beginning, but as far as I know, that was Michael Piller. That was okay. really his instinct to try to tell uh, a more integrate, you know, more seamlessly integrated series of episodes. That that you know that, that was in a, there was again Hill Street Blues was sort of around at the time. I think that there was some idea that you could tell a, a, a more full story. And not just have to like warp away every week. And I think the Starbase setting essentially, um, you know, lends itself to that. It's right. It's, it's a it's a lot easier and more natural to tell those kind of st continuing stories when you don't change your location every week. Right. Mm. Things things would have to have uh, consequence because you're not going to uh, leave at the end of the episode. Right. Right. Well, we. I mean, in in Deep Space Nine, none of our problems ever went away. <laughs> we dealt with them for a time being, but we were stationary ultimately, and that meant that you know we weren't just going to warp away and never go back to that world or think about it again. Yeah, things things come to you. Well, yeah, we we, we certainly went and and caused lots of you know problems of our own. I mean, our characters certainly went out there and found things and did things, and that was part of the show too. Um, but just the the nature of doing a station show and ultimately a show that was kind of about for lack of a better term, like UN peacekeepers, more than, more than like, you know, age of sail, you know, ship captain out there in the, out there in the ocean. Um, you know, it's just a different, it's just a different kind of story. And, and one lends itself much more to standalones that don't have to connect to each other. And the other lends itself much more to, you know, telling stories that have consequences that ripple for seven years. So were the Maquis a part of this plan very early on? Well, not from the very beginning. Uh, the Maquis were something that were was really uh, were really created to help launch um, Voyager, Voyager because they were an integral part of that. So we really wanted to do that. But it, they fit really well into our into our our little world. They certainly lean more into the Cardassian con conflict than the uh, than the Dominion one. Um, yeah, I would but, argue that DS9 used the Maquis better than, than Voyager did, or got more mileage out of that idea, I would say. Well, we, we had the advantage that we could keep them as bad guys. Right. <laughs> you know? And that, 
that lets us milk that idea a little more. You know, once you once you put them into a Starfleet uniform and you you unify the mission, uh, that sort of takes care of that. You know, um, and so for us, they remained antagonistic, uh, and and that meant that we could keep them alive and explore them more fully as, as you know. In in a, in a conflict type situation, I mean, they certainly explored lots of the key characters very deeply, but but the conflict had to go away pretty quickly because it sort of probably would have. I, I wasn't on that show, but I, I assume it would have felt like nonsense to keep it going too long, because like you're going to all die if you keep up this nonsense, and they're not stupid; they're Federation people at the end of the day. And yeah, and so, the Maki have no backup in the Delta Quadrant either. I mean, you can. I guess you can keep having new Marquis members come in on Deep Space Nine, whereas on, on Voyager, you've only got your small crew and that's it. Sure. You've got a handful of Marquis who are like, they need to get home. Like, they got no beef with Janeway. <laughs> Not really. You know, I mean, their beef is with the Cardassians and with trying to maintain their, their colonies. They don't really give a crap about Starfleet, you know, ex as an adversary, except that they're an obstacle to that. So I, I understand why we were able to milk the conflict longer than they were. It made a lot of, lot, it made more sense for the story we were telling and they, what they did made more sense for the story they were telling. Mm. Okay, so you say that Deep Space Nine was like uh, originally intended to be um, serialized from the beginning, which is interesting, I didn't know that. Well, at least lightly serialized, at least with mm. a continuing serialized element. I, I think, obviously, as time went on, we became more and more comfortable with that serialization, and we leaned into it more and more to the point where we're... But don't forget, like, we did a... We did a... Uh, a Bajoran episode to end season one that led into a three-parter to begin season two. So yeah. it wasn't like that intention wasn't there. The intention was always there. Um, I just think that, you know, both we we as a staff and also the people paying the bills all became more comfortable with it over time and the people yeah, i think you know, it, don't I underestimate think when, you the people paying the bills have a right to you know have a right <laughs> to weigh in it's their money <laughs> well when y'all got to uh season six and started with the uh the dominion war and that six episode arc at the beginning i remember watching that thinking that it was uh it was it was innovative i i wasn't familiar with uh other you know big primetime modern tv shows that that had that serialized uh format and and then you know especially towards the end of the show those final 10 episodes if you want to count the the finale as as two but i think it, i think it's 10 episodes total mm -hmm. and uh you know honestly it, it is structured like modern day prestige format tv that that could be like you know a season of game of thrones basically sure. the exact same format sure uh, look, I, I think Deep Space Nine certainly innovated a lot and, and maybe helped pave the way for some of that stuff, some of that kind of storytelling. We didn't come out of nowhere, though. I mean, people who, who know their television history know about Hill Street Blues, and they certainly know, like, Wise Guy, which did, I think, every three or four episodes of Wise Guy was sort of an arc, you know? Um, so they did long serialized arcs on Wise Guy, and and there were there were plenty of other shows out there that had at least some element of serialization in prime time, but it was rarer, and it was very rare in syndication because the whole idea of syndication is sort of like, uh, you know, sit down, watch a story. You you might not catch the next weeks, <laughs> you might not have caught the weeks before, and so you know that's a different. That's a different kind of that has a different kind of need to meet the uh, to meet the um, to meet the expectations or the needs of the audience, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of storytelling is just it's a different kind of storytelling. Um, but yeah, I think we we did help pave the way for I think a lot of the sort of modern bingey type of television shows. I like as writers, was that kind of a um, different different format than what people were used to uh, working with? Was it was it kind of hard to you know, figure out how to make all the different episodes connect and stuff when, when I'm assuming people had a lot less practice doing that. Um, I think, you know, I think Ira for sure had worked on a, a soapier show. Uh, I think the Fame TV show had some serialized elements and some continuing stories. So it wasn't like he'd never done that before. Um, I have to think back over Michael's body of work. 
Um, but literally, you know, at some point it was like, all right, we'll break a two parter, we'll break a three parter, we'll break up another two parter, we'll do another two parter. Hey, let's do a you know a six parter, <laughs> and by the time they were done, a ten parter. It it's it's not like you know again people we all knew a lot of us had written features and we knew how to write longer stories it's just a question of like figuring them out it's it takes a little more time certainly anytime you increase the length of the material it's sort of like a geometric progression if you want to tell i i feel like if you want to tell a two-hour story it's not twice as hard as a one-hour story it's actually like four times as hard um i feel like every time you double the the uh, the length of something you kind of square the difficulty and the amount of time it takes at least in the writing stages. Um, so yeah, they took a little more work. You had to make everything mesh and and you had to make all the stories come together well. But it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't an impossible task. <laughs> it was just work. So um, if you guys had had. Um... How should I say? In in this modern era of 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 televisions, like the TV shows that we're getting today, you guys mentioned Game of Thrones. Um, we get to see a lot of what's going on in like all of these different places, and I suppose Enterprise kind of went that route with showing us what the Zindi were doing mm -hmm. um, during that third season. Do, do you guys think if you if you had the opportunity, you got you guys could have could have kind of done that with the Gamma Quadrant? Like if the Dominion had become a thing earlier on in the writer's room, do you think you guys would have enjoyed showing kind of what's going on on the Dominion side of things very early on without it being necessarily connected to what's going on in the beta in the Alpha Quadrant and on I DS9? Think, I think on Deep Space Nine, our approach was always to tell stories from the point of view of our characters. Um, we did do open scenes from time to time. Open An open scene technically is a scene without one of your main characters in it. Mm. But what we tended to do was expand our pool of what we considered point of view characters by any time we had a character that clicked and we brought them back, you know, they became, mm. became essentially point of view characters. So Garrick and, and, uh, Kai Wynn and, and, uh, Gold Ducat, but also the female shapeshifter, Wei Yun, Wei, Wei Dose, Wei Trace, Wei Quattro. <laughs> um, they, they all sort of earned their status as POV characters, and I think that a lot of them got open scenes. I mean, they almost all got open scenes at some point. Um, I don't know that we would have done that right from the start uh, in that we, we sort of wanted to earn our way into those stories. Um, like I said, we did do open scenes from time to time, but we were always trying to like land scenes in the point of view of one of our characters, or, or mm. a lot, most of the time. Um, look, and nowadays, yeah, we could definitely do like, if you were to reboot Deep Space Nine or do a sequel and do it streaming, I think it would feel much more structurally, much more like Picard than it would feel like even the old Deep Space Nines. And then you would probably have multiple POV characters. You'd probably, you know, have them coming at the same story from different angles. Mm. And you'd build the story that way in the same way they did with Picard with those cutaways of the Borg Cube stuff. Yeah. Right, and I feel like y'all did that on Deep Space Nine, you know, very noticeably when uh, af after the Dominion War stuff started, and in that that final season, all those all those scenes on Cardassia Prime with the the Founder and Wayun and Damar. Sure, but those those by then were our characters too, right? Those were they became point of view characters by that point, like like the female changeling Wayun, Damar. Um... And uh, and Ducat were were characters in the show. Uh, they may not have been regulars, but we had we had we we had contracts with them to use them multiple times a year. They were they were they were what we call in the business recurring. They were paid as recurring, mm. um, and that's a different situation uh, than a guest star. It's just a whole different ball game. You know, you know you you know the character you're writing for. You know, I can put Mark Alimo in a scene with you know jeffrey combs and no that's going to be a good scene you know they're just there's they're as good as it's as good as writing for two regulars right i mean you know their voices you know what those actors are going to bring um a lot of times you know open scenes can be dangerous when they're guest stars because you have no idea how those characters are going to work or how those actors are going to work out um so you know yeah by the end absolutely they, 
tons of open scenes, right? T tons of scenes that would have been considered open if those characters hadn't sort of become part of the family by, by then. That's interesting, actually. That might explain why, like, uh, things like in, in The Witcher, I guess we get these open scenes like you described them, and sometimes like there's there's not much chemistry, not much connective, I guess, tissue between two characters, and you kind of like, or between two actors. And the scene, the scene isn't necessarily bad. It's just it's not clicking too well, and that might explain a, a bit, you know, what you're saying there. Well, there's a there's a certain kind of alchemy that comes with, you know, television requires a certain kind of alchemy. You you need because television is really dependent on character and on performance and on interactions between characters. You know, we 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 just need actors who can deliver those scenes and we don't have a lot of time to shoot them either I and mean, we're shooting uh in a tv show typically you're shooting six seven eight pages a day a, a movie might shoot one or two pages a day so you have more time to massage performance you have more time to you know build scenes and work them out um and so television is really dependent on good performance from actors because you have less time with them, you have less room for error, and you you just need to be able to go through those scenes very quickly. And that needs a good actor who really knows their shit, uh, their stuff. I don't know. Is this PG or PG thirteen or G? Oh, I, 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 mark, I mark this thing as explicit just in case every time. So sure, sure. <laughs> uh, you need people who know their craft, and so we found such. So so many of the of these wonderful actors because we kept casting these great character actors and i think part of that is like when you're throwing people in prosthetics you know you don't need them to be famous leading men when you or women when you throw them into the prosthetic um you need them to bring that character and those chops and we just we were just very blessed to find as many wonderful um recurring characters as we did and every one of those recurred because the actor earned it you know, Wayne wasn't written to recur. Jeffrey Combs was just so great. We were like, <laughs> Yeah, you kill him in the, the first episode. He's, he's in. dead. Like, he, we kill him. And they're like, Damn it. Well, it's a science fiction show. Surely we can think of a way to bring him back. And there was um, uh, there's a role playing game. I don't know whether you know it. It's called Paranoia. Have you ever heard of that game? You guys know this is a tabletop role playing game from back in no. the day. Yeah, I, I've heard of it. And one of the premises of Paranoia is that. If your character dies during a mission, they just clone, they have a clone him. They have a clone in a vat of that character. So you might suffer some penalties and, and your clone might not be as, you know, it, you might get a little multiplicity effect over time. Uh, but there was always a backup of your character. They just wouldn't know anything about the mission they died on and they wouldn't get any experience for that mission. <laughs> so that was kind of like, for me anyway, I can't speak for Ira, but that for me was the inspiration for just going like, well, they've got a clone of him. They just clone him every time he dies. Let's just do that. So, uh, that it does, it, I mean, it fits in perfectly with how the Dominion work anyway. So, 100%. Like, the Dominion doesn't really give a fuck about you. Yeah. Yes, here I go again. The Dominion doesn't really care about you. <laughs> they really don't. They just don't. They don't. Nope. The founders don't really care about you. Uh, they, 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 uh, they care about themselves. That's. That's why they're the opposite of the Federation. I mean, they have an army of, of druggies that they're drugging themselves. So. <laughs> Correct, yeah. I don't think the Jim and R were born addicted to that stuff. That was clearly part of the genetic <laughs> engineering that they did to them. And, you know, the fact that the Vorta are sort of instinctively subservient to the founders a lot of the time, I, you know, I don't think that's an accident. Um, I don't think that... You know that 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 pecking order is very carefully crafted um, by them, but yeah, it does. It fits it fits pretty well with that sort of top down. Like ah, yeah, you're disposable. We'll just bring we'll just bring another way even out of the vat. Section thirty one. Um, did you, you guys invented section thirty one basically, right? Because oh, yeah. section 30, it, it came out of Deep Space Nine for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you do you guys think you 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 could have done that uh, again earlier on if? Uh... Or was that really an idea that spawned kind of later on and then... I think it, we, that? we did it when we thought of it. <laughs> yeah. You know? I think it would, might have been fun to do it earlier and it might have been fun to do more stories there. We also liked that we thought they were sexier. The less you saw them, the sexier they were in some ways too. For us, anyway. 
Yeah, well, uh, it keeps them kind of intriguing, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, look, there's going to be a whole show about them now. That's awesome. Uh, Maybe. And, uh, well, I have I have friends on that staff. Okay. They are. Um, but I, I have confidence. They are very good writers, and I think you'll be very excited when you hear who they are. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think for us, they work better that way. The Obsidian Order in a certain, a certain amount of... I, all those clandestine services, the Tal Shiar, Obsidian Order, Section 31, for us, they work better in the shadows. And since our characters weren't in any of them, I mean, might have some peripheral connection to them, but they weren't part of them. Uh, they we uh, we always felt that they they felt better as like sort of like you know what spy services are supposed to feel like you you can't really see them very well mm. you're not supposed to be able to um, although like when we when we got together to come up with the sort of mythical season eight we did we did have a one of our regulars one of our main characters we we revealed was deeply involved with section thirty one so that was going to be that was part of our fictional, our fictional season eight story. That was great, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I really liked that. It was a lot of fun to do. It's just, you know, it was old home week. It's <laughs> great to be together with all those guys again. Yeah, it, it, it's my favorite um, Star Trek documentary, by the way. I mean, it's really fun. It's very idiosyncratic, which I really like. You know, uh, God bless Ira, but his instincts are never to do something like the expected way <laughs> and that that and the, so that and we benefited that from that enormously on deep space nine you know we sort of we sort of were continually like iconoclastic and that certainly is an iconoclastic documentary and it really fits the show well and it's 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 beautifully done uh, can i ask you about ira himself and what was that like kind of when the the baton kind of passed from michael pillar to ira stephen bear and uh do you feel like kind of like the direction of the show changed a little bit going into season three and the, and the stuff that came later? I mean, Ira, you know, don't forget Ira was always there. Ira was the first person Michael hired. Um, and so he was always a big part of steering the show. Um, and Michael didn't just vanish into thin air, you know, he was still weighing in and, and giving his opinion on the episodes. Um, so it's not as like, um, it wasn't a violent transition, you know. Uh, I think, you know, they're they're both Mike, the late Michael Pillar and and the not late and still wonderful Irish Stephen Bear are both extremely talented guys, and they both approach story from character first. Um, and so, yeah, it didn't feel like a huge change from my from my perspective. Um, it felt like a natural evolution. Michael had was focusing on, on other things, and we were still trying to, you know, make Michael, you know, Michael was still signing off on the stories for the first year he was gone, um, and then I think we earned his trust. Specifically, Ira earned his trust, and 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 he just said, "Go with God," and he, he focused on other projects. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, just. Uh... I always always felt like season three was kind of when the uh, show uh, really figured out what it wanted to do. You know, that, that's when we we bring in the the Dominion in, in full force. That's when we we add the Defiant. Um, it, it 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 feels more like uh, I don't know. It's, it's weird to describe it like this, but like the show feels more Deep Space Nine ish starting in season three than it does uh, in seasons one and two. I think that's fair. I, I would also say that Next Generation feels more Next Generation-y in Season 3 than it did in Seasons 1 and 2 as well. You know, I Oh, think yeah, that, that's for sure. TV shows sometimes take a while to find their legs. Um, what do you think and... that's so common with, with Star Trek that uh, sometimes uh, you know, it, it, takes a, it takes a couple of seasons? It kind of seems like all of the, uh, all the shows from the, the Rick Berman era, they kind of all needed a, a couple of seasons before they, they really uh, figured out what, what they were going to do. I, I think the bottom line is television is hard and big epic science fiction television is is doubly or trebly so, you know? Um, and I think mm -hmm. all shows tend to find a, take, take a while to find their feet, or most shows do. Um, I think when you have the sort of technical challenges we did on Star Trek, big casts, ensemble, tr you know, trying to figure out all those characters, 
some of those characters we figured out faster than others. Um, sorry, there's like giant helicopters that just flew over my house for some reason. Um, checking on quarantine violations, probably. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I just think you know it takes time sometimes. I I feel like it's tough to do a show like that. And be firing all guns right out of that, right out of the gate. And don't forget, we were doing like 26 episodes a year. So there was a lot of, we were going fast. And I think when you're going fast, you know, a lot of these sort of modern shows, they do 10 episodes. They write all the episodes before they ever shoot. They rewrite everything over and over again until they feel like they all work at this, you know, like gangbusters. And then they shoot. And I think that that's, you know, that's just not how things were done back then. Back then, it was like, got an order for, you know, I don't remember what the heck the initial order was, but it was like, you know, 20 in the first season or 18, whatever, and then 26. Yeah, it was, it was 20 in the first season. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were sprinting from the word go on that show. And that was true of a lot of all of those shows back then. I mean, those Star Trek shows got big orders. They had big casts. They had big production hurdles, and they and they 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 were they were going fast right at the beginning. And and sometimes when you're doing that, it does take a little while to find your feet. It's crazy how how um television is going to change in, in, in the way it's done. Well, how would it? It would have definitely like nowadays. I think you know if we launched Deep Space Nine today, we it would be much more like Picard, like I said, or or, or like Discovery. We would do we would launch it as a 13 episode show probably we would have spend everything a crap written ton more money on the episodes yeah we'd have everything written before we put it out the episodes would cost you know even adjusted for inflation i'm not i can't do that i don't know the math right off the top of my head but i, I guess adjusted for inflation an episode of deep space nine we might have spent maybe seven million dollars on um you know we'd spend twice that now probably uh, I don't know what they spend on an episode of Discovery, but I'm sure, it, or an episode of Picard, but I'm sure it's way more even after an adjustment for inflation. Um, I think than, it was ten uh, million actually for the first season of Discovery. I'm not sure about that, but I, I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think that's what it was initially, and then they they uh, increased that. Yeah, I'm just doing the math right now. I'm looking it up right now, and to see what what the uh, inflation calculator you know says. And end year 2020. And I will just... Now you guys will all be able to back do this backwards and know how much we spent per episode. I'm not going to say it out loud. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem right. I don't think... We, th th this is saying that it would be about... Um, our budget would be about 4 or $5 million today. I, I think it would be way more than that. Um we we made we made it for a responsible price though, and and so that that was different too, right? So so it would just feel different. It would be like my, the production values would be like over the top, I'm sure. Um, you'd write it as one continuous 13 episode story essentially, and you know you'd you'd write the scripts well before production, which helps you um, which helps you execute those kinds of things. And that would, yeah, that's how, would, that's, that would be the way you would, you would approach the show. Um, it would feel different, you know. I think there would be a lot, there would be a very, there would be basically no standalones. If you took a, a, a season of Deep Space Nine, it's 26 episodes long, and you took out all the standalone episodes and all the material that wasn't related to the arc, I wonder how much story you'd have, you know. Certainly in the later seasons, you might have, maybe you might have 15, 16 episodes worth of stuff. Season one, you might have what? Six six hours, <laughs> yeah. You know? It wouldn't have been a lot. I guess just the the Cardassian stuff. Yeah, I guess you'd have you know you'd have uh, you might have toss because we would tie it in better to the Dominion, even though we always intended to uh, Captain Pursuit. Uh, you'd have you know Dax because that's character stuff probably. You'd have the pilot. You'd have in the hands of the prophets progress, maybe maybe Duet. progress. You definitely have duet. Duet's interesting because it it, it it works as like um as the serialized arc, but it is very much a self contained kind of story, isn't it? Well, that was our always our goal, even with the except for the giant multi parters, but even mm. 
even the episodes that stood in in the main continuity that were part of the big story we were telling, we always wanted them to feel like an episode you could watch on your own. I mean, The Wire is all about like Cardassian politics on some level, and it's about the history of the occupation. But the idea is not that you have to have watched all those other episodes to understand it. You know, it's supposed to stand on its own. Same with Duet. Um, you know, same with some of the even some of the Dominion episodes. You know, Heart of Stone. Or the, the spoiler work is a Dominion episode, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's not supposed to feel like one. You know, it's supposed to hit you. You know, that was one of I yours, think. wasn't it? You, you wrote that one. Yeah, yeah, I co-wrote that one with Ira. Yeah, that's with uh, with Odo and Kira in the cave. Yeah, yeah, poor poor Nana. <laughs> if if they uh, did make Deep Space Nine today, you know, we would lose a lot of those uh, little standalone episodes that are really good, like uh, a lot of the uh, Ferengi stories. I guess collectively really, have kind of their own art. To her. But... I... Not really, though. I mean, they really are sort of standalones. You definitely lose all of those. Right. Uh, and, you know, some people would argue that would be a good thing. No, I, think I love the Ferengi episodes. There's, I plenty always Ferengi those. Ep there's plenty of those that I would miss. I would certainly miss, you know, the, Mag the Magnificent Ferengis. I would miss, you know... Little Green uh, Men. Little Green Men. Uh, and I think you would also lose a lot of, like, you, you'd lose from, even from um, season one, you'd lose Necessary Evil, probably. I mean, it is about the occupation, might keep it, but, you know, that's the danger of the, the sort of highly serialized storytelling is it does, you do lose the opportunity to tell those nice little stories that stand on their own. I think there are shows that do it well, like, and where you still have those, but I think a lot of the most memorable episodes of some of the most serialized shows are the ones that, that, that tell a complete tale of their own. Yeah, I definitely. Mean, the fly in the meth lab episode of Breaking Bad is brilliant. And it's mm. completely its own little story. You could cut it out and not even, you wouldn't miss a beat in the overall arc, right? Um, but it's a great little story. I love that I episode. Think. Yeah. It's, it was pretty divisive, though, when it came out, I think. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I well, mean, is, uh, everything's Ryan divisive Johnson nowadays. Does. The internet exists. <laughs> <laughs> Science is divisive. Yeah, apparently so. Actual facts are divisive. I mean, you know, whatever. Everything's device. It would be okay. such a shame, though, to take out all of those Ferengi episodes out of Deep Space Nine, because... I think it would be. And amazing. I think it would be a shame to lose, you know, some of the weird little, you know... It would, it would, be, it would suck to lose wrongs darker than death or night, you know? Is that necessary to the, to the arc of the series? Not really, you know? It's a dark and disturbing episode. Um, but it's, it's cool, you know? I would hate to lose that. I would hate to lose um, the sh Hello? Did we lose them? Maybe. Maybe. We do have a bit of technical yep. difficulties so, on his back. Wait. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, you okay. were lagged out. Yeah, you just oh, cut sorry. out for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just saying, like, I think any episode... I, 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 I enjoy serialized storytelling, and I, I really do. And I enjoy the serialized shows, but I do feel like sometimes I would like to watch an episode where I felt like I just saw a great story from beginning to end. It maybe it connects to what came before and, and what came after, but that story was really strong, and I totally get it as like its own standalone tale. I, That's I missed, kind of a lost art now. That. Yeah, I mean, I, I I would love to do a show uh, in the current sort of serialized world. Well, Prodigal Son actually is was a was a was a is a version of that where you know the the standalone mysteries existed i think each episode stands on its own but they're much more tightly con continuous than what we did on for example elementary um and i think that that's a, a good model for how things kind of work you know the best possible version of how they could work nowadays if you wanted something that told more standalone episodes um or just be able to have those you know extra episode here or there where you're not like beholden to move 80 different plots forward all the time. It's not really true. There isn't one I can think of off the top of my head in Game of Thrones. Um, or uh, the they have like that, that one uh, like episode that's like just the battle on the wall that I guess you could kind of watch on its own. But even then, like yeah. you wouldn't, it, you wouldn't know like 
the nature of all the conflict like between the different characters it, it would lose so much what makes it great yeah, you if, lose if you, a lot don't you, uh, you yeah i'm not it. saying i'm not saying that that like i want episodes with no continuity in them whatsoever i'm just saying like i would love to see a show that did more that could do an episode like little green man you yeah. know the the other star the episode franchise six, suddenly now it's little green men episode seven we're back into continuity <laughs> episode eight we're in continuity maybe episode nine suddenly we're doing like you know looking for parmok and all the wrong places <laughs> or whatever you know have um, you watched the mandalorian i i haven't yet no I, I haven't gotten disney plus yet i'm sort of like moving through i'm trying to decide which which other service to cut if i'm going to get disney plus <laughs> yeah because there's so many now yeah. Mandalorian I, is a I great example. Will, I'm sure I'm going to watch it, but I, I haven't yet. It, it yeah, does I, handle that that, that um, both serialized and episodic kind of aspect really well. Yeah, that, I, I hear that. I hear that each episode is like its own little action adventure episode, but that it all ties together. Mm. Actually, well, uh, to be honest, I haven't seen all of Elementary. Uh, that was my wife. My uh, wife on the tube loves watching that. Um, but I found it a, a nice show in the sense that even if I didn't know all of the you know the complete story i could just sit down and watch it because it, i guess it is um it, there's always like a killer you got to find out who it is or whatever well but, elementary um, was absolutely like old school in that in that way and mm. we tried to construct every episode that you so that, or almost every episode of the 150 something that we did as a doyle story like mm. you know, you don't have to know anything about what came before or after to read a Sherlock Holmes adventure from Doyle. You just sit down and read the thing, and there might and yeah, there is actually some continuity in the Doyle stories, little bits here and there. Um, but that was sort of our our model for this type of stories we were telling on Elementary was those Doyle short stories, and so we were trying to tell a complete mystery every episode, which we always did pretty much, with a, maybe one or two small exceptions. Um, and, uh, the B stories were, were usually where the serialized element was, but even then some of the B stories were like Sherlock and Joan haven't suddenly find out that their neighbor turned their next door, you know, the place next door into a, into an Airbnb and there's noisy people in there and they're pissed off. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty small B story, but it, it was fun, you know? So we did stuff like that too. Well, that's life, isn't it? That, that's what happens in life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, a lot of our B stories were about Sherlock's addiction and his struggle with and his recovery, yeah. or they were about you know Joan trying to find her way in life, or they were about the two of them doing that as a relationship, um, and those played into the larger arc. But we also did little you know odd little standalone ones too that you don't really need need a ton of continuity to understand, you know. But that's an old uh, Elementary is an older is an old fashioned show. In its in its structure, not necessarily in its storytelling and its pace and all that other stuff, um, but in its its structure, it it harkens back to some of the great mystery shows of the past, that, and purposely so. You know, that's what we're trying to do. Mm. Yeah, I think kind of a ideal format is when you you can have like that hybrid of standalone episodes that do have a satisfying ending and tell a, a self-contained story but also be able to move arcs forward like kind of the uh joss whedon model where you know on his on his shows he would do like these really specific episodes that were just about like one thing like the whole episode is a musical or the whole episode right. is a silent movie but he would also right. hush is great these season like, arcs. Hush is terrific and look the most memorable episodes of buffy in some ways are those really high concept fun standalone episodes mm -hmm. um but they that moved a little plot i feel like i mean we're very deep in the weeds and like in like television theory but i feel like it's tough in the current climate to in the current storytelling uh, approach to have like a single memorable episode because everything is so serialized like i just watched the boys and i really enjoyed it it was great yeah i agree but you can't. Well, you can't. But state. what episode? Tell me an episode. Yeah. That you're like, that's the best episode. Yeah. Because it's all kind of one ten-hour episode, right? You come out yeah, of they, that. They thinking, lose their identity. Was... Yeah, exactly. The epi individual episodes lose their identity to a certain extent. Mm. You know? uh, I was gonna say, like the Expanse season one. There's like one episode which is very memorable. Memorable to me. It's where they go onto the. Uh, they go onto a ship and they kind of like. 
inspecting this broken down uh, ship that's uh, adrift near. Um, yeah, yeah, near, yeah. I know that episode. That's anyway, a great. Episode. That, that episode stands out to me because it has that kind of self-contained smaller story where they go and check this out and they kind of figure out what's going on there. But that one stands out because it isn't part of this. Well, it is still part of the serialized story, but it it can work on its own, and so it does stand out a lot. It's tricky. It's a very tricky thing to do, to try to do an episode that is in a serialized format, but that has a very distinct beginning, middle, and end of its own, while still servicing the larger thing. Where you're not just like dropping out of your continuity to, to tell this tale, but you're in the continuity, you're telling this tale. And I think that, you know, especially in the, there were many times in Deep Space Nine, that was our goal. Um, you know, I'd like, I'd love to see more of that. I'm not saying that I don't want to, I'm not invalidating anything. Like I love shows like elementary that tell just individual episodes all, you know, forever. And they're really fun to watch. Or, and I love shows that have more continuity and I love shows that are so much continuity that, like I said, I can't tell you, I can't distinguish. I mean, I guess there's the one where they go to the Christian revival thing. Right. But it's, it's yeah. tough. It's tough to pick out like this episode is about that, you know. It's it's singular moments. It's like oh, the time they they captured this guy, or the time yeah, this the dolphin stuff. Like that's super yeah. memorable, and it hit, like ironically, that is kind of a weird little side story that doesn't tie to anything else. Um, but yeah, it becomes more about memorable moments than memorable episodes. I guess that also reflects though, the way people watch TV. You know, people watch five, four or five episodes in a row sometimes, and 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 they're not distinguishing so much between episodes because they're running right from one to the next. Right. You know? People complain when when things are released weekly now, like like on a the CBS streaming service with how they do the the new Star Trek shows. A lot of people say, "I wish they would just put the entire thing out at one time." <laughs> yeah, but then you you lose the discussion all. though. Yeah, yeah, That's I would hate that because I talk about it every week. Also, monthly subscriptions from every person. Out there. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> I like the idea of having an episode a week because then you can kind of Me discuss too. it during the week. Whereas when it comes out, if like all ten episodes come out the same day then it, it becomes more a competition like everyone has to race to the finish and you have to race too just to, to not get spoiled or to not you know have the fun kind of taken out of it i mean look game of thrones was once a week and, and part of the fun of that show was that it was such an event to watch that week's episode you know Absolutely. um and i so i i and watchmen too same thing you know watch i haven't seen that yet Watchmen. That now that's an example of that's a great example of a show that had at least a couple episodes that were like, and one in particular where you're like, that episode was a great story, all of it, all, all of a, all in and of itself. It was part of the continuity, but it, it's yeah, a, that's a good point. Yeah, it had it had episodes that are very memorable on their own. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I know the one you're talking about. Like it's uh, you know, it's obvious which one. Yeah, like a lot of shows. But there's only just... ten, though, right? So you know, sure. How many of those can you can you have and still service that overall plot? Yeah, absolutely. Bringing it back to uh, to Deep Space Nine, the mirror universe. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you would have worked with that a bit more? Well, we we might not have done those stories at all if we were doing thirteen a year. You know, we did one mirror universe episode a year. That felt like enough to us. That would have been such a shame. <laughs> Yeah, instead, maybe it would have been like a Mirror Universe season or something. It's interesting if well, you take those episodes Discovery, out. Right? They, they, they did like, what, it was a five or six episode arc at the end of the first season of Discovery, right? That's all yeah, right. in Mirror Universe world. Um, yeah, we might have done that. Uh, you know, it's really hard to know. It's hard to know how that show would have felt done today in terms of structure. Um but those are certainly episodes that if you were if you were to cut together like the supercut of the Deep Space Nine arc, you would cut all those episodes, right? Mm -hmm. They'd be gone. You'd cut all the Ferengi episodes, or almost all of them. Um, well, you could have found a way to kind of integrate them differently. Maybe if you guys... Had, like, sure, sure. I'm just saying, like, if you mythically took 26 episodes a year of Deep Space Nine and decided you're going to cut it down into 13, 42-minute episodes, right? And 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 push the arc, geez, you wouldn't even do past tense, probably, right? Yeah, no. I guess. Yeah, no, you wouldn't do the saying. visitor, and that'd be heartbreaking. You wouldn't oh do my the visitor. goodness! You know? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you wouldn't do the trouble of tribbles, trials and tribulations. Nope, not or, part or, of the sorry, arc. Trials and tribulations. Yeah, not part of the arc, man. I mean, 
Ooh. I don't want to. I don't know. I don't want to do that super cut now. I, I don't want to. I don't want to cut those. No. <laughs> in the cards, I mean, we can do anymore. in the cards. It's part of the arc, I guess. But we probably wouldn't do it, right? And that's such a great little episode. Um, I would miss all those things. I would miss, you know, I would miss them all. There's too many, too many that would be like, oh God, why are we, why are we cutting this? O'Brien must suffer. Would you you'd cut them all? <laughs> You'd cut them all, man. You'd cut every single one of those. Um, you'd, and that, you'd cut Deep Space Nine. It wouldn't be the same show. It wouldn't be the same show, right? And look, every show is a product of its time. I think it's 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 it's. Uh, I, I think the, the the benefit of all these streaming services is that Deep Space Nine is out there to be watched in its entirety by anybody who wants to anytime they want to. And yeah, uh, bless that. That's awesome. Well, I know Ira talks about it a lot whenever I see interviews with him, but how uh, Deep Space Nine wasn't as popular when it was on, and then how the streaming era, or even before that with like the DVD box sets, when people would just like sit and binge shows for the first time, DS9 got more and more popular. And I noticed that because I was uh, always a big DS9 fan before it was cool, you know? And so like I noticed when other people went from thinking I was kind of weird for liking that more than Next Generation or Voyager or the original series. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm not alone. A bunch of other people also love Deep Space Nine the most. Yeah, I, I think it is definitely a show that benefits from those from that kind of viewing experience. I think it's a show that, you know, it, it, if you want to sit down and, 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 and watch four or five of them in a row, you know, for a few nights a week, for a few months, uh, it lends itself really well to that. Um, and uh, so it's nice to see that. I mean, Ira and I always used to joke, um, and Ron too, and Renee, that, that you know, they'd appreciate us when we're dead. You know, they'll appreciate us when we're dead. <laughs> um, you were right. Well, we're not dead yet. Yeah, they're not dead well, yet, but... <laughs> not all. Some of us, unfortunately. I, I, I feel like the show... I feel like the show probably wasn't as appreciated when it was on the air as it, as it is now. I think well, yeah, it works true. so well as it works so well for binging. Also, like uh, we 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 were we were in the middle of peak track, right? We were almost never on the air by ourselves. Next Generation was on the air when we started. Voyager was on the air when we finished. The movies were coming out, and so you know we definitely uh, that hurt us. I think to a certain extent. Um, in that, like, there was just a lot of truck out there, and people could pick what they wanted to watch. Um, if they needed their weekly fix, there was plenty out there. And so, you know, Next Generation benefited from being the sole show that was on the air when it launched. Uh, Voyager got a ton of promotion because they were using them to launch UPN, the network. Um, and that really just, just wasn't the case for us. You know, we just, it was easy to sort of let us slip through the cracks, I think. Um, so it goes. Still went seven years. It all worked out. Yeah, it all worked out. It worked out quite quite well, honestly. Because it, it is now considered one of probably the, the, the favorite show from all of the trickies, I think. The tricky community loves it so much. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I, it makes me happy when I see that. You know, when I see, and when I, I, I love seeing, you know, new fans who've never watched it before watching it for the first time. And like tweeting about it or whatever, um, and 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 seeing their impressions, you know, even when they get to the ep one of the stinkers, it's still fun. <laughs> it's still fun to to see them, you know. Uh, I don't think you could get as irate about some of our bad episodes as, as some people do if you weren't invested, right? Uh, so you know, um, it's it's just fun seeing people discover the show. Yeah, um, it is because we're passionate that sometimes we get frustrated about this or that. Hey man, we we were frustrated about some of those episodes too. Uh, <laughs> they, they some of them exist because of the the schedule I was talking to you about. You know, mm -hmm. twenty six a year, and like we we'd have one or two it that we get away from us every once in a while um, because the cameras weren't going to stop shooting. You know, so we well, you, get oh, in, in that sense, you guys had an excuse. Like you guys had an excuse for bad episodes. <laughs> well. Uh, you know, I don't think there's ever an excuse, but sometimes they happen even to the best of us. Um, I like to think that even our bad ones are fun in some ways. I mean, I, I can't remember what, I don't think there's, 
Is there a Deep Space episode that's just flat out boring? You know, I don't think anyone could accuse us of ever being boring. Even when we're falling on our faces, we were at least doing so, I think, in an entertaining way. <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, uh, Especially what's... Trekkies have a way of, of, of finding the good in everything. Because, like, they watch and rewatch so many times each episode, even the ones that they don't appreciate, that they, they, they find things that they like, and they always find something that they, they, they enjoy. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, now I'm forgetting the name of the episode, but that first season episode where they're all playing that game, Oh, Move Along Home. Move Along Home. That is not a good episode of television. I um, actually enjoy it, but, but I, know, I know I'm in the minority. But look, it's <laughs> entertaining. That's the thing I'm trying to say, right? Like, they're, them playing that hot such game, it's ridiculous and silly and everything, but it's it's fun and memorable, you know? It's the Deep Space Nine meme at this point, I think. Yeah, yeah every, we're, this one everyone we're talking makes about how he killed a kid playing soccer, you know? <laughs> it's not a great episode, but it's not a boring episode, I don't think. <laughs> You know, Vanessa Williams in a bikini and, and worth, worth murdering someone playing a childhood game. That's you know, something to watch. But even, even in something like Move Along Home and the Alamorane, Count of Four, Alamorane, you know, like everyone makes fun of that it, that moment in the show. But I, as a fan, have found value in that just because I like how into it Avery got. Um, and it made so sense because, yeah, Cisco, he's like the parent. He's the dad. So he can do childish stuff like that. He he play, he likes to play with kids and, you know, throw baseballs with them on the holodeck and sure. and be that type of guy. Whereas, like, with Kira, it was, like, torture for her to do something ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, even but... in something like that, there's cool little character stuff. 100%. Because we had talented actors, and, you know, they committed to their roles. And so there's always, like, like I said, I, I always have said, like, the one unforgivable sin of television is to be boring, right? If if you're boring, then then that's it. People turn you off. What they don't have they don't have to watch this. Um, I don't think we ever committed that cardinal sin, you know. And and some of that's because of us, but also some of it's because we just had such a wonderful cast. They always brought something to to an episode, you know. Even 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 when we maybe didn't quite uh, deliver the way we should have, or when the production values weren't quite there. You know, they were always bringing it. God bless them. Can you talk about who were some of like your your favorite uh, people to write for, like as as far as characters go? I mean, I love them all. To be honest, it's it's tough to pick pick just one. The, the truth of the matter is, all of our regulars were terrific, and you know, we had a little trouble figuring out some of their voices at first, um, but that was on us. Um, but once we kind of clicked in there, I, there wasn't one of them I didn't want to write for. And then the recurring characters were there because they were fun to write for, mm -hmm. you know, because we wrote them a scene, we, they put it on, we put it on its feet on stage and the actors found some amazing stuff to do and the character popped and you were like, Oh, I could write more scenes for that character. Um, you know, there's a bit in the documentary, I think. Where Marco Lime was like, no one ever told me you li liked what I was doing. It's like, idiot. We wrote like 30 episodes for you. Of course we liked what we were do you were doing. If we didn't like what you were doing, we would have put a bullet through your character's head. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, they were all, I, I, I mean, there were, there were some, like, obviously, it was always fun to write for the characters with the most distinctive point of views and sort of the most off-kilter point of views. It made Quark and Rom really fun to write for sometimes, and uh, Garrick. You know, but I, I loved writing for Kira. I loved writing for Cisco and Dax and Odo and all of them, you know, Bashir. Um, because you, th there's nothing a writer likes more than knowing that when they write the scene, it's going to be good. It's going to be well executed. I mean, that's really what, there's nothing more deadening than writing a scene and thinking, oh my God, this actor's going to, this is never going to work, <laughs> you know? It's the worst. And I've, I've very rarely had that experience in my career, thank God. Um, but there, that that was never the case on Deep Space Nine. You were never like, oh, God, they're going to screw the scene up so bad. They're not going to bring anything, you know. I've been very blessed. We were very blessed on that show. But, like, I was also very blessed on Elementary. I mean, like, Lucy Liu and Johnny Lee Miller and, you know, those guys are always going to bring it, you know. Um, we had a great cast on Particle Sun, too. It's, it, that's what it's all about, though. I mean, like, it's it's not even like I love this character. It's like I know this actor 
will bring this scene to life and it will be a great scene. Um, and that's what makes it fun to write. Yeah, I often say that Deep Space Nine has such a good cast that you could build a show around any one of the the main characters on that show and 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 have like a a compelling compelling show. Yeah, we were Absolutely. yeah, that's, we were blessed 100%. Like and and all of them very talented, all of them reliable, you know. All of them came knowing every word of dialogue they were supposed to do that day. Um, they were always prepared, always thoughtful, always bringing emotion to all their stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what makes characters fun to write for. I think a lot of people have wanted the, the Kira kind of spin off or the Kira <laughs> sequel for, for, for a long time. I would watch a Kira action. I, I would like do a two hour Kira movie, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm like a big, um, I'm a big comic book guy. Like, I I read a lot of comic books and like a lot of the the Star Trek stuff that IDW's done. Done. I always thought it'd be good to do a prequel Kira, like all of her backstory with the Bajorans, all the stuff with her in the occupation. Like, take all those uh, conversations about like all of her history and just like build a story around that. And because I, I want it to be like visual, I want to see it. And I, I think that'd be like a, a really cool story to tell. Like you could do it in a novel also, but like, no, I want it in a comic. I want to see it. Yeah, I just want to see like, I want to see the, uh, um, the, the uh, oh God, what was the Cheryl Easter Run movie? The period, Atomic Blonde. I want to see the Kira version of Atomic oh. Blonde. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, I want to see like the Kira version of like uh, uh, the Born Identity. <laughs> You know, that would be an awesome, like, Kira doing some crazy terrorist crap during the occupation, you know, at, at like, whatever, she, whenever she started, 19 years old or whatever. I, I would, I would, you know, pop some popcorn and Oh, go, yeah, people, people you know? would love that. I would, That'd love, be amazing. I would eat that up. That would be awesome. And, but all, you could do that with all, any of them, really, you know, they each would lend themselves to a different kind of story. Um, and we got to do that. Like we did center a story on every single one of those characters many times, you know, a few times. They each got their own episode a few times a year. And, you know, that speaks to the depth of the cast too. We didn't just have to play to our lead every time. We could just go like, you know, Cisco will be in this. You know, Kira does I think Kira has one line in the wire, I think. Yeah. I feel like Kira has like one line in the wire. She's just literally there, like to remind you, yes, she is in the cast, and we're gonna pay her, and here she is. Um, and then there's like you know, second skin where it's all her. So um, we just had that. We just had that blessing to be able to do that. Okay, well, um, we've run for an hour, so that's pretty much how long this show goes for. Thank you so much for coming on. It was it was an honor having you. It was really fun to be here. And I uh, hope people are out there, you know, if, if they hear this and they haven't watched Deep Space Nine, they'll go out and stream it. Um, <laughs> yeah, what are you doing if you haven't watched it? Oh my I, God. I mean, you're, you're stuck. Everyone's stuck at home right now. They got, you got nothing. No excuse. Do. You've got no, no excuse. excuse. Start. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a residual check. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have watched Deep Space Nine, though, because this, this, pod, this podcast goes over everything trick and we do spoil quite a lot so i hope they've watched these space nine at this point i hope so um i hope if they have if they have watched it if maybe this will inspire some people to watch it again because i get paid every time you watch it people so get to it. <laughs> how does that work does that even work on netflix yeah yeah it's all because of the uh because it's writer's guild it's, we, it's my union my union uh my union makes sure that we get paid every time one of our episodes airs I mean, it's it's there's some technical way that it's all figured out. I don't know what that yeah. is. But anyway, guys, I gotta so, go. But it's great, that. great. Yeah, exactly. I just cast check. Uh, uh, but all right, uh, well, but thank, thank you so you. much. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. All right, take care, guys. All right, see ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.